Hello everyone, this lesson is going to be on the muscular system. Um, it's going to primarily focus on what are called skeletal muscles, and those are the muscles that are attached to your bones, attached to your skeleton, and those are the ones that allow you to move. The other two kinds of muscles that you should be aware of that I won't talk about in this presentation are smooth muscles. Those are the muscles that are under involuntary control. In other words, you don't have any conscious control over them. These are ones that you find throughout your digestive system, lining your digestive system for the mixing of food and for the process of peristalsis. You also find smooth muscle around your blood vessels that are important in terms of regulating your blood pressure. The third kind of muscle is cardiac muscle and you only find that in one location and that is in your heart and that one is also under involuntary control. So the skeletal muscles that we see here, what it's showing is that we're going to go through several different stages of magnification, taking a look at the skeletal muscle, the bicep muscle here. So they're talking initially about a bundle of multiple different individual muscle fibers or muscle cells. Then we zoom in a little bit more and we see these longitudinal sections of individual cells, the individual or single muscle fibers. But if we do take a look at these, we can see that there are multiple different nuclei that we do have in one of these cells. And the reason for that is that originally during embryonic development, these were in fact multiple different cells that were separated here by the cell membrane. But what then does happen is they fuse together and we then get these very, very long single muscle fibers, which are multinucleated. So they are microscopic, but they can in fact be several centimeters in length. Going down a little bit further, so around every cell, of course, there is the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. So if we do take a look at the plasma membrane here, we have these other now smaller, magnified even more, what are referred to as the myofibrils. Within the myofibrils, we can divide them into segments. These segments that I'm showing the border of here, which are the Z lines at either border, and these are referred to as the sarcomeres, and those are the functional units or the contractile units when we're talking about the skeletal muscle and muscle contractor. So we're gonna be talking a lot about uh, what goes on within each one of these sarcomeres. So for each individual uh, myofibril, for each muscle cell, there will be many, many, many of these sarcomeres that are all kind of lined up end on end. This is showing us one of the sarcomeres and what we're going to focus on is what is referred to as the sliding filament model or sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. Just to identify a few different regions and portions of the sarcomere without going into all of the details, you should know that the borders on either end, those are referred to as the Z line. So this is a Z line here. This is the Z line over here. So those would then be here, it has it as the Z disc, and those would be the borders of an individual sarcomere. So again, on the left-hand side, there will be another adjacent sarcomere that we find there and on the right hand side, another adjacent one as well. So what goes on within the sarcomere between these two Z lines or Z discs that we do have? Well, we also need to identify a couple of protein structures, the major contractile proteins that we do have in muscles, and they are referred to as the actin and the myosin. So here, what it's showing in blue, this is the actin muscle filament or muscle proteins, and these are also referred to as the thin filaments because, well, they are thinner compared to the other ones, which are shown in red here, and those ones are the, the myosin. So myosin, they are the thicker or the thick filaments. So we'll take a closer look at what the actin and myosin do look like in a minute here. But if we just kind of focus on the sarcomere, the borders of the sarcomere, when a muscle does contract, the sarcomere in fact does get shorter. So this is the relaxed picture at the top. So if we take a look at the Z lines, what we can see is that when a muscle does contract, those lines are coming closer together, closer to the center of the sarcomere. Right at the center of the sarcomere, it doesn't have it identified on here, but running along the middle where all of the myosin is attached to, this is called the M band or the M line. 
So we're going to have the actin filaments that are going to be moving a little bit closer to that M line within the so-called H band. So if we do take a look at the unrelaxed muscle fiber that we have here, and if we take a look at the inner edges at the edge of the H band or closer to the M line within the sarcomere, that's where we do have the two ends of the actin. And what's going to happen when we take a look at the contracted position, we can see that those two ends of the actin, they do come closer together. If we take a look at the lengths of the individual actin and myosin, what we'll see is that the lengths of them on their own, the actin and the myosin, neither of them do actually shorten. So here is the length of one of the actins. And if we compare that to the length here, it's, well, exactly the same. There is no difference in the length of the actin, whether the muscle is relaxed or whether it is contracted. If I do exactly the same thing, take a look at the myosin. So these are the borders that we have here. And we can, well, actually perfectly line those up. And we can see that that is exactly the same also. So in other words, when we do have a muscle that contracts, neither the actin nor the myosin are actually going to get any shorter. So what is happening is we're going to have one filament that is, yes, sliding past the other filament. So overall, what we're going to see is there's going to be a connection between this portion of the myosin right here, and that is referred to as the myosin head. It's the myosin head that is going to interact with the actin and essentially grab onto the actin, and it's going to move the actin from either side, which is attached to the Z line. It's going to move the actin toward the center. So the actin filament on the left is going to go toward the M band or M line, and the one that's on the right is going to go in the opposite direction. So that's where we do see that the distance in the unrelaxed uh, muscle fiber between the two ends of the actin is going to be further apart, and here they're going to be closer together when the muscle is contracting. Let's just take a closer look at the thick and the thin filaments or the actin and the myosin. So this picture that we have here, it has it as the myosin, but again, that is the thick filament. This one, it has it as the thin, but this is the actin filament that we have here. The actual structure of the myosin is we talked about these bands sort of, sort of wound around each other, and that is the myosin tail. And then we have these heads, and it's the heads that are actually going to interact with and grab onto the actin filament. So that's the myosin. The actin, what we have are a whole bunch of repeating units or polymers of the actin protein. So I like to sort of think of these as just a whole bunch of beads on a string. Those are the individual actin proteins that are all joined together. Uh, but it's not just one line, it's two of these. And then they're twisted around each other. And that's the basic structure of the actin filament. A couple of other proteins that are associated with the actin filament that you need to know about. One of them is referred to as the troponin complex. It's going to be important because that is the attachment site for calcium ions, which are necessary in order for the muscle to contract. And we'll see how that comes into play a little bit later. So the troponin complex is also attached to a third protein that you should be aware of. That is called tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is this band that runs along the length of the actin filament. And what it actually does is it blocks or exposes the binding site for these myosin hits. So in order for the myosin head to actually interact with the actin, we have to have the tropomyosin shifted out of the way. The way that it shifts out of the way is due to a conformational change in the structure of the troponin. And that happens because calcium, as we will see, attaches to this troponin complex. So we'll take a look at a little bit of a clip here that's going to take us through this process of the contraction. 
So in this picture, what we can see is a bunch of the different structures that I have been referring to. Certainly some of them are more important than others. Uh, once again, you should know the borders of the sarcomere, which is the Z disc, the actual name sarcomere. And in this picture, we have two different sarcomeres lined up end on end. Don't worry too terribly much about the A band and the H zone and the I band. But within the picture that we see here, um, showing in purple, that is going to be our myosin. So along the length of the myosin, that's where we're going to have the fibers that are wrapped around each other. And then we're going to have these heads. In this case, the heads are interacting with the actin, which is shown in green. So let's go ahead and play the animation here. And I'll just let you read the caption at the bottom as we take a look at this. Okay, so we could see in that animation that the myosin heads, they were kind of wiggling around a little bit. We'll see that a little bit better in the next animation that I'll show you here. And as they're well, kind of wiggling around, they're not just wiggling around, but what they're doing is they're grabbing onto the actin filaments and they're shifting them within each of the sarcomeres. They're shifting them towards the center. So essentially what is taking place is one filament is sliding past the other the actin filament is sliding past the myosin, and that is what resulted in the shortening of the distance between the Z discs or Z lines and the shortening of the sarcomere overall. This is a very energy intensive process, and that energy, of course, is in the form of the universal energy source for cells, which is ATP. The role of the ATP, and I'm going to start down here at the lower right hand side where we do have ATP that it's coming in and what it's going to do is interact with the myosin head. When it interacts with the myosin head, initially it says here that the myosin head is in the low energy configuration. So at this point, it's actually not able to grab onto the actin and shift it over to slide it past the myosin filament. So the role of the ATP is going to energize that myosin head. So if we take a look at the orientation of the myosin head here, that is in the relaxed position. This now is in the energized position. So how does that happen? Well, you need to split up the ATP into ADP and phosphate through the hydrolysis of the ATP. Now we're taking that chemical energy in the ATP and we're transferring it over to the energy of the myosin head. So now it is capable of going ahead and performing some physical or mechanical function. But it doesn't at this point because it's not quite interacting with the actin filament. So prior to this, we would have to have events taking place to expose the binding site, the myosin binding site on the thin or the actin filament. And in fact, these little sort of black dots that they're showing here, that in fact is the myosin binding site. So now we wanna have the head of the myosin interacting with the myosin binding site on the actin, and that's what we see up here. So now the connection has taken place. All that needs to take place now is the energy needs to be released from the myosin head. As it releases that energy, it's going to return to the low energy configuration. But in the process, if we take a look at this arrow here, it's physically going to shift that actin filament over. In other words, sliding it past the myosin. This is going to be repeated over and over again. So we're going to have ATP coming in, uh, the release of the myosin head from the actin filament, and just repeat this over and over again in order to have the shortening of the muscle. Another animation that we'll take a look at here, this one a little bit more simplified in terms of the diagram, but um, much more information is provided here. So right in the center, this is where we do have our myosin and uh, the myosin heads that we can see. If I just kind of point out where those are, and we'll kind of focus on those myosin heads and how they're going to interact with the actin. 
This is the actin that we have here. Here we're just taking a look at the one sarcomere. So at either side, we have the uh, Z lines or the Z discs, and they're going to start off by talking about the role of calcium, the role of calcium in terms of interacting with the troponin, shifting the tropomyosin out of the way, and allowing this interaction between the myosin and the actin. Once again, I'll just let you go ahead, and you can read the captions as we're taking a look at this animation. So these are the steps. I'll let you uh, take a look at this, read through each one of these steps, but it does really go along with this uh, picture here. And with the previous picture that we took a look at, which was, oops, sorry, which is this one here as well. All right, so the last one is one that just shows a little bit about the calcium and the role of calcium. So um, skeletal muscles, they are under voluntary control. So what we would have is a nerve cell. This is a nerve cell here or a neuron. Messages coming from the brain or the spinal cord impinging on this muscle cell that we do have here, passing a message on to the muscle cell. When that message is passed on, we need to have some calcium that is released into the cytosol of the muscle in order to have this interaction between the calcium and the uh, tro uh, troponin as we saw in the animation. So the calcium inside of a muscle, it's stored in a region that is referred to as the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Here it's just abbreviated SR. So when a message does come from a nerve cell, when that message reaches the muscle, the first thing that happens is it leads to the release of the calcium out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol, and that's where you have the actin and the myosin. So that calcium can now attach to the troponin that we see here. Once it attaches to the troponin, it can shift the tropomyosin out of the way. Once that tropomyosin is shifted out of the way, then we can have the myosin head, which interacts with the myosin binding site on the actin filaments and we can have the sliding of the actin filament past the myosin. 